while earlier, I, I sense a stirring in my spirit in a particular direction. Um, the atmosphere isn't isn't there you know, anymore. I mean, that atmosphere isn't there anymore, but the burden is still there, and I just need to navigate, you know, into it by the Spirit, um, because of what I think God wants to do. Uh, those of us who are church people or who have a Christian background, who have been in church for long, are accustomed to programs, we're accustomed to meetings, we're accustomed to sermonizing and teachings and all of those things. What we're not too accustomed to that the Lord is bringing the Lord is making familiar with us or make us familiar with right now is the ability to connect with heaven and move with heaven. The ability to function not from the earth but from the heavens. The difference between Jesus and the leaders of his day was that Jesus was not an earthly being nor did he function from the earth. Jesus, there was a power at work inside of that man that the people were conscious of. The people knew he was different. But they didn't know the secret of the power. They didn't know what, what set him apart, what made him different. It's not because he is Jesus of Nazareth. Because everything he is, he is for us. Are you with me? Jesus is first of all everything he wants us to be. And then he does first everything he wants us to do. Jesus did not need to ascend into heaven. He was already with God in the beginning. Everything, his coming, his dying, his resurrection, his going up, is to create, is to create, is to clear a path so that we can go. Everything was to our benefit. The Bible says that uh, 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 our forerunner has entered into the holiest or beyond the veil. And the Bible says it's gone for us. Now, the word for us actually does not mean on our behalf in, in, in the sense that now he's gone and we don't need to go. When you see him, he's representative of us. No, it is not that. But otherwise, he, the Bible would not say a forerunner. The sense of a forerunner is one who has gone announcing or heralding that after me there would come another so the presence of the forerunner in a particular place is evidence and is message enough that others are coming so the presence of jesus in the holiest of all for, was for us everything that he did he did for us are you with me while jesus walked on the face of the earth his center of gravity was not in the earth when i say the center of gravity his propensity was not leaning towards the earth he lived in another power he lived in the earth in the power from another world. He was operating heavenly power right here. No wonder he, he, the people were marveled in his days. He spoke to a tree and killed it with his words. It, it didn't take four months. It didn't take six weeks. The very next day, the tree had weeded out to the very root. Not just the surface, to the very root. And Peter said, Master, the tree that you cursed yesterday. And Jesus said, um, is, it, is it this? Leave this, these issues. These are the small issues. If you have faith, say, even as a grain of mustard seed, you not only do what was done to this tree, you speak to this mount, Gilbatra, you say, be thou plucked up, be thou cast into the sea, and it shall obey you. He says, so this, this, the, his, he, he spoke to the wind. And the, the Bible says there was a mega calm. And the people said, what manner of man is this? When I say man, what specimen? I mean, what type? Like we have seen men, but not this type. What is it about this one? What type? What specimen? What, what class? What, what type of a creature is this? What species of man is this? Now, the reason I'm saying that is because that species of man, in fact, not even just that species of man, but a, a new species of man, a higher species of man, is what Christ has brought forth in us. Jesus never defined himself by anything earthly. He said, who are you? He never would say, maybe I'm the, the son of Joseph. Or he would say, I'm from Galilee, from Bethlehem. He said, who are you? He would identify himself with the Father. I am from above. It is not that he, he did not come from Bethlehem. He did not drop from the sky. He didn't fall down from the sky. But the earthly identity was not his holding facility. He, he was not an earthly person. And he was able to stay beyond that which was temporary and transient. And he didn't allow that which was here to define the conduct of his life. Naturally, he was from a Jagunle. I mean, he was from the, from the lowest of the suburbs, you know, of Galilee. That's where he came from. He was from Nazareth. <laughs> Can anything, has anything good ever Go and check the history. In fact, they said, check it. And they went away. Because they were confident that no matter what, what records, re read the book of Joshua. Read the book. Read all the books. You'll never see that anything came out of that place. 
and yet, uh, yes, out of that place, one was coming. The truth was, really, he wasn't from there. Actually, in fairness, he really wasn't from there. He says, I'm from above. He drew his strength from God. He drew inspiration from above. He drew knowledge from above. He drew power from above. He drew wisdom. And he that is from above is above all. He stood abreast of everything in the earth. Now he's saying that reality that I walked in, I want you to walk in. Are you with me? I was sitting there, you know, and just feeling the atmosphere and then looking in the spirit at what God is doing. And um, I could feel the weight, you know, of the burdens, you know, in, in many hearts. I could feel the struggle and the dissatisfaction, the anguish, the sense of the sense of injustice that people have been subjected to. You see, we've suffered so long, many of us, that suffering is, 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 is part of the human race. And even though we are no longer part of the world, though we've been delivered, we preach it that you've been delivered from the power of darkness. And you have been translated. There's been a geographical movement on the internet. You have been taken from a place, you're in a different place right now. Still, we're subject to all the vagaries, you know, of that former world. Paul cried out in Colossians. He says, if you've been risen with Christ, if you've been raised with him from all of these things, it says, set your affections on things above. It says, if you have been crucified from all of these things, you know, why are you living in the world? Are you subject to all this? The, the, for, for me, the, the most important thought is, why are you living in the world? In Paul's thinking, you are no longer living in the world. So if why as though living in the world do you subject yourself to these things these ordinances, these laws and all these this, this things in the earth I'm about going somewhere or I want to unlock something by the spirit for us because yesterday uh, we were yesterday morning I believe we were looking at um, the, the facts that were in a season of convergence and there are many dates you know that are coming together you know, uh, uh, many circles, you know, of 50s that are closing, you know, closing this this year, and particularly uh, maybe this, this this month. And we began looking at uh, what 50 represents in the Hebrew thought, uh, which was a culture that God gave them. God was governing the earth, through, I mean, through the Jews. The culture he gave them, like I said yesterday, were a representation of heavenly things. The substances were in heaven. But God gave them a representation so that if they carry those things out, the righteousness of God will be here and a type of heaven will be represented in the earth. But you see, the Jewish culture and all that has a spring inside of heaven. God gave them the culture of the 50. And on the 50th year, the people were supposed to experience uh, 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 a jubilee, which, like I said yesterday, was a financial reset from every uh, 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 position of difficulty that people have been brought into. Over time, people have enslaved themselves. People have gone into debt. People have got, come into conditions of crisis. They've come into a place that they ought not to be. But the 50th year, when the shofar of Jubilee began to blow, the people began to receive liberty and liberation. I believe that uh, that window is open right now. And I, want, uh, I, I think that the Lord wants us to take hold you know, of liberty by faith. I'm sitting here and then I'm, I, 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 I can discern the burdens and cries and sense of dissatisfaction in many, many lives. There are some of you, you've done some things in the past that made some decisions that were not wise. You made some mistakes, you know, yesterday, and those mistakes have complicated your life and they've put you in a state where you wish you could have a different life. Do you, you, do you ever wake I'm talking to people right now because the Lord put that burden on me. Now you, you wake up and you wonder, but how long, how long again? How, where, how, how, how long will this life continue? You wish things could go back. You could just go back in time. You know, how many people have that? You wish you could go back in time and redo that. And maybe write that, rewrite that jump. I swear to God, if I go back in time, if you give me time, God, I will read my book like crazy. I, some people won't say that. God, I will stay with that job. God, I will stay with that man. I will do this. There are regrets in our lives. We want to go back in time to redo some things just so that today, you know, will we'll be the will of God. Now, the good news is that you don't need to go back in time to, act, to, to, to accomplish that, you need to go into Jubilee. Because what Jubilee does is Jubilee takes you back in time or Jubilee resets that which has been done in time. It takes away the injustice. Is somebody with me? I 
I am tired of believers who proclaim the truth. They're pressing into the, 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 the deep things in God, and yet they are totally harassed in, yes, by the devil in every area of life. I am a believer in process. I'm a believer in suffering. I believe that the path of, to glory has sufferings in it. I believe that the training of sons has sufferings in it. I believe that when we suffer, the spirit of Christ and of glory rests upon us. I believe that the, the, the message of suffering is taught you know, in the New Testament and those, all those who must live a godly life must suffer persecution. There's a place in our theology for suffering. Jesus taught it. The Bible says Christ has once suffered for us without the gate, leaving us an example that we should follow in a step. Jesus said to, to his disciples, he said, if I, your Lord and your master, you know, they've said this and spoken this and done this against me, they will do also to you. So suffering is part of the curriculum of the gospel. However, not all suffering is of God. And not all suffering is necessary. Some of us don't know the difference when Satan is the one molesting you and frustrating you and then putting sadness upon you and damaging you and all that and we, we just take it, we swallow it because we're afraid somewhere to not be subject to, 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 to process. You know, we, we don't want to be found not being subject to process and so we just take it, we keep taking it. At some point, I, I got frustrated in my life. I said, see, I need to be able to discern when it is Satan because some of you have rewritten your theology in such a way that you can't even find Satan anymore. It's no longer part of that theology. Everything bad. It's either we blame God or we, don't, or we praise him and say this is his process so we thank him for it and then we keep suffering. But there's this Satan running around loose somewhere and many times he puts things on us. Sometimes it's just the, our, our foolishness or our lack of dexterity, our lack of wisdom, you know, that puts us in difficult situation. However, many people still accept it. They call it process and they continue. Are you with me? One of the things that I believe that the Spirit of God wants to do in this session right now, you know, before I, hand, I, I drop the mic and this meeting is over, is he's going to do a personal reset for some people here. Amen. God told Israel repeatedly, I, I, you know, I've been scrolling through scripture since yesterday till, till even this morning on, on the outstretched arm of God. I'm thinking that perhaps I might talk about it, but somehow I'm not feeling the, the enablement or the release of the grace. So I think maybe Prophet Babs will, will do that when he steps in, you know, later. But I'm looking at the issue of the outstretched arm of God because it's one of the themes, one of the major themes we're looking at in this prophetic gathering. But God repeated, repeatedly told Israel, let's just see how I brought you out from Egypt with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm. I don't know how many times God said it, Moses said it, and even Isaiah speaks about the outstretched, uh, Jeremiah speaks about the outstretched arm of God. It says, oh God, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power. Nothing is too difficult by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. The outstretched arm of God was that was that divine intervention into Egypt that broke 430 years of bondage. The people who had been in slavery, they had been molested. These were the people of God. These were the covenant people of God. God separated them from among the nations, elevated them in the spirit, put favor on them, gave them the oracles, I mean, gave them the covenants and all of those things. But in the meantime, they are locked down. They are completely locked. They are shut down. Listen to me, church. I believe the Holy Ghost is going to set some people free. Um, they are the people of God. That is their spiritual identity. Right now, they are not realizing that. Right now, they are slaves. They are supposed to be building the tabernacle of God and then bringing forth divine worship. Right now, they are not doing that. They are building the storehouses of Ramses and Petum. They don't even know they are God. They don't know what they are. Somebody described it. He said they are totally erased people. They have no sense of their calling. No sense of fulfillment in life. What they are doing, they, they, their present expression falls short of what God has determined and prophesied that they would be. And, you know, they express the, 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 what the will of God has determined concerning them. That is not what they are right now. Until that thing called the outstretched arm of God came forth. 
What was locking down Israel in Egypt wasn't just Pharaoh. What was locking down Israel in Egypt were the gods of Egypt. It was Satan himself. It was a power from, I mean, from the heavenly places that was subverting the ability of these people to go on to become everything that they are supposed to be. It is a power that is denying the will of God from happening. It's, a, it's an injustice against the people of God because the satanic world, you know, foments injustice. They are locked down, they are shut down. They are not what they should be until God visited Israel. Are you with me? <clears throat> God, God says to Moses, go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Pharaoh is a surrogate king, a representation of the gods that was holding down Israel. Pharaoh would not let the people go. God told Moses, he said, I know he will not let the people go. No, not by a mighty arm. And then we're told that it was God that had in his heart. The reason is because he didn't just want Pharaoh to let these people go and then let the gods go scot free. He wanted to judge the gods of Egypt. Yesterday, I gave you people a sign. I said, uh, uh, shortly before, I stepped into my room and I picked my wristwatch. I looked, looked at my wristwatch and it was 12 12. And this morning, the Holy Ghost led me to Exodus 12 12. And I turned, I flipped, I said, okay, that's, you know, the scripture I said, and it's this one, you know, that Sebastian just quoted right now. God said, God told Moses he was going to bring those mighty plagues and all of those things and destroy the firstborns and all that so that he might judge or execute judgment on the gods of Egypt. Egypt had uh, between like 100, uh, uh, 1,500 to 2,000 gods. But majorly, there were 10 of those gods that were uh, uh, more vocal or that were the major gods. And when God released the plagues, the plagues were to break the power of those things in the realm of the spirit so that the people will come through, the people will come forth. So God bringing them out required some mystical things, required some interventions of power, the release of a mighty power of God. When the Bible says by a strong hand and by an outstretched arm, it's talking about the release of a particular type of the power of God, a particular working of the power of God. I'm saying that because I see God wanting to do that right in this meeting. And then this is locally, but generally in this season, there's going to be the mighty release of the outstretched arm of God in order that uh, Abraham's seed might be brought out of hard servitude. About 1988, um, there, was a, there was a move of God, you know, the, the, that happened globally. You know, uh, many people recognize the move as a prophetic move because the prophetic realm opened over the church. Now, as a young boy, you know, uh, um, having fellowship up you know in the north you know we we saw the move of god happen but for us it wasn't the prophetic realm that opened it was actually the mystic realm that opened i was a student you know in my uh, sophomore year you know in in, in Bauchi at the time when uh the, the the president of my fellowship walked into our room they had kicked us out of fellowship a few you know months earlier you know i was bible study called you know uh and uh when my, when my tenure ended, they didn't want us anymore because I was teaching Kenny Higgins Revelation. And that was too much. It was too far advanced, you know, for them. We were teaching faith. We were permitting the girls to, to do their hair and, you know, and all that. And they just couldn't take that. Wear the earrings. They just couldn't take that. You know, so they let us out. And still after they pushed us out of fellowship, they knew that these guys had something that we don't have. One day, the president came upon a particular prophecy that he read and didn't understand. He came and knocked on our door. I said, hey, guys, how are you guys doing? I said, I read this, I saw this thing, I read it, I don't know what it means. Can you read it? And when you read it, then come and interpret it to me. And she dropped for us the Jendit prophecy that was written in 1619. At the time, we thought it was written in 1914 by Charles Price because that copy was found among the paper of Charles Price. Until we called it the Charles Price prophecy. If you go online and type the Charles Price prophecy, you'll get the same prophecy. But actually, it was written by a Christian mystic called Jen Lead. Now, we didn't have internet at the time. You know, we didn't have cell phones and all of those things. And so some, we had some brethren who were over there in Zaria, you know, through, you know, had, you know, the, the move of spirit beginning to brew, you know, among that company in Zaria. We were in Bauchi. And so we waited until the end of the semester. We rushed over to Zaria with our prophetic parchment because we had never seen anything like that. In fact, we didn't think a human being would be that knowledgeable. 
I grew up virtually in church. You know, I never seen anybody say anything like that. I grew up in a Pentecostal church. The kind of message my pastor would preach was something like who born dog. I mean, that's the title of a message for real. Hey man, the wicked. I mean, that's the title of another message, you know, I remember. You know, but the, it was a very evangelical, you know, church. We did miracles. People walked out of wheelchairs, you know, out of, you know, they dropped their crutches and stuff like that. But I never heard those kind of words. So we're speculating that maybe an angel brought this parchment from heaven and dropped it. You know, because we didn't know that men could enter into that depth of knowledge and understand the things of God so clearly. So we rushed over to Zaria at the end of the, at the, end of the, of the semester, and we said, guys, you know, you, you guys won't believe what we saw. Then we pulled out the prophecy from our, you know, from our bags or wherever we kept it. As soon as we brought it out, they brought out the same prophecy also. They said, we got it too. And we're like, wow, like how? Remember, no internet, no nothing. The angel of the Lord just came administered that because he, he wanted to open up a page, a chapter in the realm of the spirit. And that was how that move of God of 88 sparked off. Now, during our last voice to the churches, a prophetic conference, um, a babs, it was under the hand of God and began to prophesy. They said there's something of God that began in 88, you know, that got short-circuited and never came into full term because the people who were the carriers of that move did not have the spiritual administration, the maturity or the wisdom. They didn't have the vessel to channel it into the body. So the move never entered into the body. And the thing stopped. They said, right now, that's... Man, that 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 visitation has come again. The eighties has come again, and all that. He began to prophesy. After that meeting, we 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 were going over the words, you know, of you know, the prophecies, you know, in our church. And recently, some boys in church, you know, have just the, the CRM has just turned up, you know, and they could see like crazy. I mean, you come into church, and every angel that passes by, they say, okay, that one's sitting there. That one, this one's okay. You know, that time when that angel moved and all that, and you say, yeah. Yeah, you know, and you know, like you are saying something, and you look at them doing high five and laughing because they, they, they either they are seeing it or they discuss that before it comes to church. Almost every time you teach a message, you say something, you see some boys laughing somewhere or some girls like they are looking at themselves. They have gone over it, so the CRM, you know, began to open, and then uh, one of the boys, uh, you know, were, were having uh, um, a little, uh, we call it the Eagle Company meeting, you know, for some CS in the house, you know, who are in charge of our CR monthly. That was a monthly bulletin we do. And then what we're, we're talking about, revisiting that 88. And one of the young men started saying, actually, you know, the other day while we were there talking, you know, I saw the angel from 88, you know, he came to me and he told me, he said, I am, I am zeal, I am fire, and all that. He said, he said it was fire. And then he began to describe. And this other girl said, actually, yes, you know, I saw him. You know, and this, 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 that, 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 that. And they have come. There's something right now that opened in the 80s that has come again, you know, right into this time. The portal, the door has opened. And since we're talking about gates and talking about doors, we better know that that is, is an admittance into a higher dimension, a higher Christian consciousness. It's an entrance into another reality of life. You know that God has promised to us, we've, we've read it in the scriptures, but many of us have not been able to take steps because we didn't know where the gates were. Now, if you're aware of where, where the gates are, if you're aware that the time is right, then you begin to connect and then you begin to experience that. Are you with me? Now, one of the lines... You know, in Jen Lee's prophecy, actually she began to say that there will come a full and total redemption by Christ. And that redemption is a mystery that cannot be understood without the, the workings of the Holy Ghost. But the Holy Ghost is at work to reveal the same to all holy seekers and loving inquirers in the order to which the, the apocalyptic books, seals, have been broken in heaven. You know, and this mystery will be communicated to the people. She went on to say, and that's where I'm going, that Egypt, that figure this servile creation under which Abraham's seed now groans, but a prophet and the most prophetical generation will the Most High raise up unto himself, who will deliver his people by the force of spiritual arms. Let me say that again. Egypt doth figure this servile creation under which Abraham's seed now groans, but a prophet and the most prophetic generation will the Most High raise unto himself who will deliver the people with the force of spiritual arms for which there must be raised certain head powers. These are persons who are going to have favor with God and will be called to stand in the first office, to bear the office of, of the apostle. Now, all of these things, this lady penned down, you know, back in the days. Now, we're saying God delivered Israel out of Egypt. Genesis says Egypt is a type and a shadow of this, of this monstrosity that locks us down. Look at us. Look at you. 
what you are now is not what you should be. What we all are here, everybody, every one of us, starting from me to the greatest of you, none of us is what we should be. We have conditions of life, you know, in which we have been repressed. Things are not working, things are not connecting somehow, and somehow we've learned to live inside of the injustice. But the justice of God, which is revealed every 50 years, when that 50 jubilee circle comes, liberates the people. When it has come, whether it is your fault or somebody else's fault, the lawful captive can be delivered and the prey of the mighty can be set free. The freedom is not just going to be, first of all, you're bringing out, we are brought out of bondage by our being made free on the inside. So you see the word that you're receiving right now, which is the word of gospel, is the word to make you free. You can be free. We, we've been told that we, we, we need to endure this thing forever. No, there are certain things we don't need to endure. We don't need to. You've made mistakes in the past and you've been suffering for 20 years. You've still been suffering. You're still, you're still regretting. How long? How, when will you finish paying? Yes, when will you finish paying? When will you finish beating yourself? How much punishment is enough? How long will it continue? Who said it has to continue? Because something went bad and then the rest of your life is set on that cross forever. That is injustice. That is wicked. Some of us were ignorant when we did some things. We're, we're children, we're young, we're, we're foolish or something. And then we make choices. So we die forever because of that. And I think Jesus has come to set you free so that if you finish dying, you know, you'll go to heaven. At least you'll get consolation. No, that is not life in fullness. He says the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I am come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. He offers life. We can be so into this suffering message that after a while you, you start thinking that God is a sadist. I've looked in all the scripture and I found that, that you know in his presence is fullness of joy. Not just joy, it's joy in fullness. At his right hand, he has pleasures and ecstasies evermore. When he has everything set according to his will, like we see in the last, uh, last two chapters of, 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 of Revelation, he said, there will be no more pain, no curse. No sorrows, no tears, no those former things. They are passed away. You see, many times I appreciate your zeal for the Lord to just suffer, you know, and all that, you know, and live in this earth and have nothing. But you can even have joy in the midst of your suffering. He said, he says in the book of, uh, that, that he'll grant you to be strengthened with might unto all patience, with long suffering and joyfulness so you can have joyfulness even when you're going through long suffering Jesus was not miserable and morose just because you know he was going through suffering no but I've seen people who are perpetually depressed and there's no joy of the Lord in their heart in their spirit the kingdom of God is righteousness peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. You can have joy. You can have joy. I believe what the Spirit wants to do this evening, I mean in this session right now, is give you joy. It's release joy. It's not just, it's not just senseless happiness. You know that's based on nothing like when someone is, is, is a lunatic and you're laughing and there's no cause. No, that's, it's not just putting senseless happiness. No, 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 it's not that. You can have joy. You can have the joy of the Lord. You see, God takes joy very seriously. Bill Johnson says, God takes joy so seriously, he promised Jesus joy at the end of all these things. He says, just go through this thing. I'll give you joy at the end. You know, who for the joy that was said before him? He endured. So when he was enduring, what did he have his eye on? I would break into joy. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. There is a joy. Wherefore God has highly exalted him. No, it's not, that, that's not scripture. And said, the one that says, and anointed him with the oil of gladness. Above all. It was the oil of gladness. It's the oil of gladness. You can be glad and exceedingly joyful on the inside. 
Serve the Lord with gladness and rejoice with thanksgiving, the psalmist said. Serve the Lord with gladness. You can serve the Lord with gladness. You don't, you don't have to be miserable just because you met the Lord. You don't have to be depressed just because you came into present truth. There are certain things some of us are carrying right now that this jubilee has taken care of. I know that you all, all, all you all are on your path to ascension. You want to get the higher things of God. But it does not mean... If there's anybody here who does not care about whether you suffer so long as you're getting Zion, it's okay. I'm not preaching to you. Just stay in that place. God bless you. I mean, you're doing fine. Just stay there. But I'm talking about people who want to see the glory of God in the spirit, in the soul, and in the body also. And I know that there are people here who have, who have weights. There are people here who have concerns. People here who need the raw power of God to fix things. We're always shying away from the release of the power. Your life can change. That's what I'm saying. And God wants to change it. And when God does process you all the time, he don't process, he doesn't always process you with suffering. I mean, with, 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 with hunger and with privation and all of those things. No. Are you with me? I'm not contradicting myself. and I'm not contradicting the gospel. For a long time, I, I, you know, I looked in my life one time and I said, come on, have I been happy? Have I ever been happy? Because it was one trouble after another. After I was, was never having enough money, never having enough anything. And yes, I'm asking myself, is this a life? If this is a life, then I should accept it with contentment. What is it on the inside of me that is, that is rebelling and then feeling the pain of this sin? One of the greatest theologians of, of modern times, you know, C.S. Lewis, he said something. He said, if I find inside of me a desire for something that nothing here can satisfy. There's only one logical explanation to that, that I'm made for another world or for another reality. It says that when I desire, I have hunger for food, it is because there's such a thing as food. Has anybody here, has anybody here ever felt the desire to have ukanka? Ukanka. There's nothing like that. <laughs> and therefore, you've never desired it. Me neither. Me neither. Has anybody here ever desired money? Some people desire sex. You desire, you know, affection. You desire travels and all that. It's because that thing exists. So your heart knows something that your mind does not know. That's why even those times when you're trying to calm yourself, you know, and say, just take the suffering, something inside, the spirit on the inside is rebelling and rejecting and saying, no, this is not it. I need an experience of God. Listen. We're on a journey that we call the journey of the saving of our souls. Many times I even push myself away from using that phrase because it has come to limit the scope of what God is doing. I see a, a compartment of my life being touched by God, but that's not what he's doing. God is actually liberating and raising sons. He's, 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 he's raising sons in the morning star order. He is he's producing and manifesting the Kainos son of God or the Kainos creation. The word Kainos is new. The Bible says new creation. It's a type of man that God wants to put in the earth. It's a whole, it's a whole kind of, a whole species, a whole type of race that has never existed before. Peter and Co. didn't see Kainos until when Christ got raised from the dead. That was the first time they saw it, and they saw it only briefly for 50 days, and he was gone. The Kainos creation is a new type of man, the future man, all that Jesus labored to generate, and it's not what we're seeing about. We have begun a journey there, but he's going to take us into the fullness of the journey. The Kainos creation is not an earthly man. The kind of creation is totally free. The problem, I think like I heard somebody say, is that we have focused the church on the first Adam rather than expose them to the second Adam and teach them the new man that has been generated that has been brought forth in God. There are chains here that I see that need to fall. There are, see, there are conditions of life. If God can only do little things, I really won't be too 
trips. Many times we try to patronize him because we can't ask for big things. Graham Cook says the extent of a man's relationship is known by the extent of what he can ask. There are certain things I can't ask you, sir, because the relationship isn't there. But there are things I can ask you freely, or maybe I can walk up myself a little bit and ask you. The asking defines the level of relationship. C.S. Lewis says the problem with us is not that our prayers are too, our needs are too many. The prayer is that our desires are too little. It says our desires are too small. We ask God. You see, God who owns the universe. I don't know how much pastor has, you know, in his account, but I can imagine myself come to him and saying, sir, please, can I have 15 naira? Please, I beg you, 15 naira, please, please, please don't be offended with me, but I tell God, beg you, sir, please, please, I know you are kind, I know you are powerful, and please, please, 15 naira. It's ridiculous. It's it, it, to the point of embarrassing, like you said. Many times, that's what we do when we come begging God, sprawling on the floor and rolling about and asking him for what? For things that don't need power, that don't need anything to do. I say that because some of us have become content with some of our needs. We have decided, oh, that Ishmael might live in your sight. And I just felt the Holy Ghost <laughs> wants to deal. Do you understand? You're, 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 you're some people, maybe those living with HIV or those living with cancer or something, they, they create a club and they come together. They have accepted we are living with it. They, there's a, yes, they, they, they've, 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 they've settled in their mind that this thing is a part of me and then we'll just manage it and know how to, how to live with it. So some of us are living with conditions that should be going away. God wants to touch physical lives here and touch physical conditions. He wants to redress the imbalances that have been brought into your life for whatever reason. When Jubilee comes, mercy comes. Yeah. When Jubilee comes, mercy comes. I feel the mercy of God hovering over this place. God is merciful, and mercy flows from the sovereignty of God. Do you understand? Listen, I said mercy flows from the sovereignty of God. He says, I will have mercy on whom I will. He connects mercy to will, his will. He does not connect mercy to what you have done. Paul was, the, was describing in the book of, 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 of Romans. He says the children, Romans 8, he said, haven't yet done nothing. He says, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. He said, Esau had not yet eaten the porridge or despised the birthright. But God said, I will have mercy on whom I will. Then, he says, then you say, okay, if it is God, you know, at the back of it, so why does he found fault with it. Why, 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 why does he find occasion against them? Then he says, who are you that replies against God? Then he alludes to the sovereignty of God. He says, has not the potter power over the clay to do what he wills? He's, talk, he's using sovereignty to say, in the realm of mercy, there is a sovereignty of God. God will have mercy. He has chosen that he will have mercy. You're saying, but, but will God have mercy on me? If you're already saved, you have mercy already. Because Jesus is the mercy of God given to you. Are you with me? The mercy of God flows from the goodness of God. It is part of his essential nature. It's not just what God has. It's what God is. God has an eager yearning to do good. An uncontrollable desire to do good. God wants to have mercy upon you. God has had mercy on you. I'm seeing in my heart things breaking, things changing. If God needs to work 37 miracles in your life this afternoon, he will do it before you walk out of this place. Because this is the season, I'm not the one who proclaimed Jubilee. I'm not the one who has brought this, the 50 circle around. I'm not the one. This is the door that is open. Let the children be set free. Let the children walk out free. Lives are going to be rewritten. Conditions are going to be rewritten right now. Because that's what the Holy Ghost wants to do. Can you stand on your feet? I don't know what that thing is. I don't know what that condition is. But you don't need to walk a ladder of faith. You don't need to walk a ladder of faith. You don't need to walk a ladder of faith. All you're going to say is, Lord, I accept jubilee. I accept release from this condition. I accept release from this manner of life. I accept release. Listen, listen. Hallelujah. Before you go forward, let me say this very clearly. We said that 
Passover or Pentecost began in Passover. It was the big, it was the fifth, it was a feast that came 50 days after the Passover. Now, I said that Pentecost is a continuation of Passover because Jesus is Passover lamb, but Pentecost is the Holy Ghost. Everything Jesus did will be ineffective and totally useless if the Holy Ghost does not come because the Holy Ghost is the implementer. Whatever he did will be for him. He won't be able to translate to us without the Holy Ghost. It is the Holy Ghost that leads us into all truth. It is the Holy Ghost that reveals the things of the Father to us. It is the Holy Ghost that takes all the work of Jesus and applies it to us. So without the Holy Ghost, everything is bound with Jesus and that is total failure. Do you understand that? When, Pent when Passover happened, a new beginning was initiated. They started to count, henceforth, the new month, a new day in their lives. They were totally liberated from that former condition where they were slaves. For the first time in their life, many of them were born into slavery. They saw their fathers as slaves. They saw their great, great grandfather as slaves, their great grandfather. That was all that's in their mind. For the first time, they were free people. For the first time ever, status changed. Now, it does not matter how long that condition is that has been in your life. For the first time, you are going to receive liberty today. This Egyptian that you see today, you won't see them anymore. It does not need to be there. Whatever it is that is sponsoring that reality in your life is receiving the judgment of God right now in the name of Jesus. The first, the, the first thing for many people is that you need to forgive yourself. And then you need to be free on the inside. You need to walk away. You need to tell yourself that I don't deserve that anymore. You know, some people accept it because they know it's their fault. They knew it was their fault. It's no longer your fault. It's been paid for. It's been paid for. The blood of a lamb and the ram of the lamb is what will blow that creates the sound of jubilee. The ram's horn is blowing now and is declaring your liberation in the name of Jesus. Can you now receive a different condition in your life? Can you receive a different storyline? Receive the miracles of God. God had to walk up to 10 wonders in order to bring the people out. I don't know how many miracles. He's working on your behalf right now to bring you out of that condition and to rewrite the story. But you receive a reset in the spirit. 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 You are loose from that sin. You are loose from that guilt. You are loose from that guilt. You are loose from that guilt. All of that excuses under the blood of Jesus right now. You are loose from that guilt. You are loose from that guilt. You are loose from that guilt. You are loose from the guilt. You are loose from the guilt. You are loose from the guilt. Receive power now to have new life. Receive the power of beginning. 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 Enter into the gate of the beginning. Enter through the door of the beginning. Enter through the door of beginning. Go through the door of beginning. There is a power that is not earthly power that can establish your life in the will of God. There is a power that is not earthly that can establish your life in the will of God. Receive your release. 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 You are no longer bound. You are no longer locked down. 
You are no longer chained down. The chain has been broken. 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 Hallelujah. 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 We said yesterday morning that when people have sold themselves out, when people are indebted, when people have sold their land, that which is their inheritance, when, pen, when, 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 the, when the shofar for the Pentecost begins to blow, a reset button is set in the spirit and a legal machinery goes into force to legalize their release. And what happens is not illegality. What happens is legal. They are set free. Hmm. Whatever has mortgaged your life and your ability to press forward and to discover the dreams and the visions that God has put in your heart. I hear some people say, I'm getting too old for that dream right now. Who told you? Says who? Says who? Says who? Whatever is the will of God is the will of God. And it is the will of God we exalt this afternoon. We're saying, let the will of God be done in every area of my life, in my soul, in my spirit, in my body, and in my material, in my material world. I refuse to have any reality in my life that is not the will of God. I refuse. I refuse. I refuse. Hallelujah. The first liberty is that the person that harassed you has been addressed by the spirit the next level of liberty is you is that your mind has to come into alignment into agreement with the fact that you are free do you understand you have to forgive yourself and tell yourself you have a right to be happy you have a right to joy you have a right to peace you have a right to the provision of God. People need to know that God is a good God. It needs to sit inside of you that God is good and is looking for ways to bless you. Oh, this is not a common message in this kind of circle. I know the message we like, but this is the truth of God. And people need that here today. Because there's a lot of hypocrisy. You are crying under the weight that you don't need to carry. He came to set the captives free. He came to set you free. Peter was preaching in Acts chapter 3. He says, unto you first, God, having raised up the Lord Jesus, sent him to bless you. He calls it blessing in turning you away from your sins. Now, the word sins in that scripture is a word that actually means plot or storyline. He has come to bless you by delivering you from the present storyline of your life. The way your life is the story to your life. He says he delivers you from that. And he checks you into another storyline, which is that which is written in the books concerning you. Many people here are not working in the reality of the books. They are not. But the grace of God, the power of God. Actually, this thing we're doing right now, we thank God for the window of opportunity to do this. But Jesus is your jubilee. And you don't have to wait until a particular special date to express jubilee. The reality of Christ is jubilee. And when he comes, he begins to stop. You know, his name is beginning and his name is ending. He's always beginning something in your life and ending something that shouldn't be there. So there are things that are dying right now. See, they are ending. See, believe it. Believe it. Don't think you'll go back and then express the same thing. God forbid. After you live here, the visible power of God, the outstretched arm of God, and it is his mighty power will roll into your life to fix things for you. They will locate your children where they are and correct things. They will travel into your past. What do you, see, what do you think about God? 
You think that when things are in the past, he has no power over it anymore. Do you understand that God does not live in the past, not in the present or even in the future? God lives in a realm where past, present and future are constantly before him. There's nothing he can fix. He can fix your past. Oh, that sounds very great. I say he can fix your past. If you ever ask God to do something, God is like, hey, that, that cannot be done. Then I don't know if that is God that's talking to you. Jeremiah said, is there anything too hard for you to do? It's too hard for you to go into my past. And so your past is before me. Look at it. I was praying a particular prayer and, and the devil was whispering to my heart. He says, uh, it's too late. I said, no, it cannot be too late. I, 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 I back forward, I rewind this prayer to the past. Do you understand? It can't be too late. I'm praying that prayer today. Today is Thursday. Uh, today is Wednesday. I backdate it to, to Saturday. I go back into Saturday right now, if need be. But I don't, I don't need to do that. I just need the Lord to take it back into the past for me. Do you understand? We don't know the power of God. It's not too late. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not too late. You are set free. In the name of Jesus, there shall be new storylines by the power of God and his outstretched arm. There will be newness, newness. I declare it, I speak it forth. I know it is so. You receive help from God, you receive help from God, you receive help from God. Tears will be wiped, miracles will happen for you. Do you know how many miracles God did to bring Israel out of Egypt? At least you saw 10 plagues. At least there were plagues. He did one and the thing wasn't breaking. He did another one. He wasn't breaking. He, he, he kept at it. He kept going until something broke. If God needs to do 33 miracles in your life, just let him, whatever is his business. All I know in the end, I want to walk out through this door and experience liberty, experience newness, experience the rebirth of a nation. Yes, you may have made mistakes in the past. When you say, Father, I was wrong, it's gone. I say, it's gone. Don't stay behind and keep carrying it on your mind and keep carrying it on your head. God is making all things new. He says, behold, I make all things new. I make all things new. Can you receive newness in your life? Can you receive newness? Can I receive newness? I can breathe now and I can have joy. I will laugh. I will rejoice. My soul will be full of joy. I will joy in God, my Savior. I will exalt in His name. He has opened the doors. He has broken the chains. He has set the captives free. He has called me forth. He has ordered my going forth. He has blessed me. I am no longer cursed. It does not matter what I did. It matters what Jesus did. What He did is weightier than what I did. He has set me free. He has paid the price. He has brought me forth. I eschew the past. I walk right out of it. I come into a new place. I experience newness in my life. It is a new day. It is a new day. It is a new day. I see restorations taking place right now. The ministry of the, of, of the angelic for restorations, for properties, for joy, for, for relationships, for all kinds of things. See, you are not going, you are not the one that's going to do it, okay? Don't 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 even think, don't put yourself in the equation. You're not the one that would do it. It is God. He says, see what I did for you. I brought you out of Egypt. I, by my outstretched arm, I did it. So it's not what you will do. What you've done, you've done enough. What you've done has spoiled things. Yes? So just stay off now. Let him do. That means some of you will be upgraded by the Spirit of God in your mind, in your thinking. I see people coming into new levels of favor. I think God will a new favor. God. And I also see acceleration. I just, I saw it now. I saw acceleration. That means that you will gain speed. You will gain speed. You will gain speed. Let us come, let us rejoice in the realm of the, the, the omnipotence of God. Our God can do all things. Let's exalt in an omnipotent God. Let's exalt in a God who is able. Let's exalt in a God who can do. Let's exalt in a God who can do. Oh, yes. Yes, hallelujah. Amen. 
God can do more than you could ever ask or think. He holds all power in his mighty hands. When you can find the way, just remember this, my friend. God can, God can, God can, God can, God can do, God can do more than we could ever ask or think. He holds all power in his mighty hand. When you can see the way, just remember this, my friend. God can. Somebody say that. God can <laughs> ever rock so free. He holds a power in his mighty hands. When you can see a wish, just remember he's my friend. God can. of a shout to the Lord. It's a shout of victory. It's a shout of jubilee. It's a shout of coming forth. It's a shout of breaking forth. Oh yes, glory to God. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah. Doors are open, chains are broken. Favor is granted. A new day has come. Come up hither, I hear the Spirit says. Those of you who have lain slain among the dead, come up hither, I hear the Spirit say. Those who have been bound in fetters and chains, come up hither, I hear the Spirit say. Those who have been hindered from progressing and going on forward, come up hither, I hear the Spirit say. Those who are locked down and are tied down in affliction and bent over, come up hither. I hear the Spirit say, for behold, the door is open and the morning light is shining. The light of a new day comes upon you. It's a new song being heralded in the Spirit. It's a new day brought forth for you. For those that pursued you before you, see them no more. And the songs of your former times are gone. For I bring you forth into a new realm of light. It is a new day. It is a new day. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you.